Welcome to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers Podcast. Each episode will bring you conversations from business leaders and up and coming stars in the commercial real estate industry in Canada. Our guests will share their unique career journeys, passions, and advice on what it takes to be successful in this industry. This podcast is brought to you by Highview Partners, connecting people who perform in Canadian real estate. I'm your host, Richard Costello, and today I'm pleased to introduce Peggy Howard. Peggy Howard is a renowned shopping centre general manager who has been the beating heart of Ivanhoe Cambridge's portfolio in British Columbia for over 20 years. Peggy's accolades include managing Guildford Town Centre Mall during a $280 million redevelopment and expansion, which was the largest mall redevelopment in the company's portfolio at the time. Peggy was Surrey Businesswoman of the Year in 2013 and is co-creator of Shopping Centre Chronicles. Peggy is a mentor, coach, confidant and friend to countless industry professionals whose lives she continues to influence in so many positive and inspiring ways. Peggy, a big welcome to you and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Richard. This should be fun. Well, it's an honor to have you on our podcast, and I have to say, I've been thinking about this conversation for quite some time. I first met you about eight years ago, and I remember the meeting like it was yesterday. You were at Guildford in the thick of a renovation. You were busy, focused, and dare I say, a little intimidating. Over the years, your name has come up so many times by people I've met in the industry, and I've come to learn about the fun side of your personality. You're part of the band of sisters and brothers from the golden days of Ivanhoe, Cambridge, and that legacy lives on through your alumni of former co-workers. To help keep my questions on track, I'd like to break things up into three chapters, if I may. Staying close to the theme of our podcast, which is all about real estate careers, I'd like to start by getting to know more about your journey in this industry. But first off, can you give us a glimpse of what life was like for you growing up? Perhaps tell us who were your early role models and how they influenced you. Richard, I'm proud to say I'm the youngest of eight. I grew up in a small town in Quebec called Beauceville. And my dad managed a factory that employed most of the women in town. They produced pajamas. We then moved to Tedford Mines and he opened his own factory. And he sewed for Levi's, GWG, Howick, Liberty Jeans and Margaret Godfrey's Bagatelle, to name just a few. So cleaning factories at night with my brothers and sisters gave me a good taste of retail business from the beginning. And my father's management style was extremely customer service oriented. Imagine making 200 women work together on an assembly line. That's teamwork, the the likes of which you have never seen. (laughs) So being the youngest of eight makes me a people person And working in a factory where fashion retail begins influenced me. That's a great story, Peggy. I can't imagine having seven siblings. You must have had some fun growing up. So could you tell the story of how you got your start in shopping center management? Well, I met my husband in Montreal when I was working for a company called Record Chemical. I was on the order desk taking orders for turpentine, bar salt, mothballs, and all of those wonderful uh, chemicals. They also had a plant in Port Coquitlam, so I was able to get transferred to British Columbia in 1978. Um, My daughter, Corrine, was born in 1981, and we moved back to Alberta for a short period of time, but then came back to British Columbia afterwards. So I landed a job with the British Columbia Lottery Corporation, leasing and installing kiosks in about 125 shopping centers. This enabled me to meet so many shopping center managers. And when I saw how diversified their profession was, I was determined to take the necessary education to do just that. I graduated UBC's Urban Land Economics program in 1998, but was lucky enough to land a job at what was then Eaton Center in 1997 during the construction of Metropolis. I didn't expect it to be a job that took me from the lottery dreams to picking up rubbish, like my story says in the book. Within the first weeks, we hosted our president and CEO. 
The GM was away at the time, so this newbie toured them through both Eaton Centre and Metrotown, and they were discussing the purchase of Metrotown at the time and asked me my thoughts. They were so inclusive, such a departure for me, as working for a crown corporation was much more top-heavy. So Peggy, the industry seems to be an incredibly supportive one, but I'm, I'm wondering what advice you received in your early days that made an impact on you. I had the pleasure to work with Ted Williams during the opening of Metropolis as a property manager, and this man is one of the most passionate people that I know. He was instrumental in giving me the basics I required. He knew all the statistics about Eaton Centre, about Metro Town, and all the surrounding properties. Ted actually made me read every single lease in our property and gave me a week to complete this. Sounds like a huge task, but saved my butt many, many times. That team was super strong. Judy Kilbart, who is now called Judy Black, was the marketing director at the time and still is. And given I had zero knowledge of marketing, she was super helpful. We very quickly became a close-knit family. In the late 90s and early 2000s, companies like Ivanhoe Cambridge and Cadillac Fairview had large portfolios of shopping centers across the country, and it wasn't uncommon for GMs to relocate with their families to take on the next project. Many careers were developed in this way during those years. Can you give us the rundown of how your career evolved with Ivanhoe Cambridge? The knowledge that I picked up at Metrotown was truly priceless, but given I had started in such a large center with so much support, it was imperative that I become a GM in a smaller center. So when I was transferred to Richmond Center and Ivanhoe Cambridge only owned 39%, I was able to learn operations, budgeting, purchasing in much greater depth. In addition, the other 61% was owned by Cadillac Fairview. So I was able to glean some information and work with Shirley Vox, another phenomenal GM who was more than willing to teach me things. I feel that so many knowledgeable colleagues work very closely together. We shared pretty much everything. I also had the pleasure to work with another industry great, Brian Castle, who again was extremely passionate and he taught me to ensure you do everything you can to make things happen, almost at any cost. Well, during my stay at Richmond Center, I also helped out at Oak Ridge. It was so much fun to work with Doug McDougall. Right after that, I started working for a company called J.J. Barnicky. They owned 14 strip malls. So I managed those 14 strip malls for about a year and then started with Marquis Facilities Management. I thought it would be a good idea to work with the housekeeping company for a couple of years as the vice president of customer service. And during my stay there, uh, I managed to secure a contract with the Vancouver International Airport for customer service only. Uh, That was a $6 million contract. Um, I left that area, came back to Ivanhoe, Cambridge, because I love them so much, and managed Woodgrove Center in Nanaimo. And then they took me back to the Lower Mainland to Guilford Town Centre. What would you say is your proudest professional accomplishment over your career? Well, I started at Guilford Town Centre in 2008, and this was a project of a lifetime. We had over 700 people working construction. Man soup, we called it. We were moving tandem dump trucks full of soil off the site every five minutes for six months. Doing this in a live center was incredible. If you talk to any of the team who worked during this time, they will tell you it was the hardest, most rewarding, most heartfelt time that they've had in their career. We found old things like Woodward's food floor containers still on the conveyor belts as we uncovered them from the 1960s, which had been buried in a previous expansion. We left no stones unturned. We even buried a time capsule, Richard. (laughs) (laughs) Inside of your job, what put the fire in your belly to go to work and do your best every day? Funny you should say fire in your belly. I use that phrase so much in my career. 
particularly when it comes to customer service. The people put the fire in my belly, Richard, from the janitors to the presidents of Purdy's. It was such a diversified job. I can honestly say I loved waking up and going to work every single day. What were the qualities that you looked for when hiring for your team? Someone smarter than I am, that's for sure. Customer service and passion above all. I can teach or anybody can teach equations, ratios, cap rates. But the importance of customer service at every single level is crucial, Richard. And what advice do you have for anyone starting out in the shopping center industry right now? Be aware of every position in your center. You don't need to be an expert, but you do need to know some stuff in order to have realistic expectations. How long does it take to cool a regional shopping center? Where are the water lines? Where are the gas lines? Get your hands dirty. Clean that food court with the housekeepers. Now more than ever, it's imperative to have compassion, enthusiasm, and teamwork. So let's move on to chapter two. In June of this year, Ivanhoe Cambridge made an announcement to hasten a shift away from traditional shopping centres to focus more heavily on the residential and industrial sectors. From an article in The Globe, it was reported that in 2018, Ivanhoe tried to sell 10 of its 25 Canadian malls, but took them off the market last year when it could not get the price it wanted. CEO Natalie Paladechev commented that she would like to reduce the company's exposure to Canadian malls by one third. Close to 60 people were let go earlier this year as a direct consequence. The retail sector, it seems, is always constantly changing, but this does feel like a pretty major shift to one of the industry's biggest players. I'm interested, when you reflect back, what were some of the big trends and changes that you experienced? When I started in the industry, Walmart was just coming into Canada. They were replacing the likes of Zellers, Woolco, Woolworth, and Kmart. We call them a category killer. I remember sitting at an ICSC Whistler conference and listening to our elders, Lauren Braithwaite and Ron Myers, talk about Walmart taking a huge share of the market, and they did. When I was last at Guilford, they were producing over $90 million a year, in contrast to a good bay producing about $30 million. And then the outlet malls came, the off-price stores came, big box came, online shopping has grown exponentially and unfortunately the shopping centers are dealing with the returns without the original sale. And how different do you think the role of a GM is now to when you started out? I think in many ways GMs will have to go back to the basics and not uh, have all the amount of support they have become accustomed to. When I started all the GMs reported to the senior vice president without the layers in between. Personally, I liked that much better. Many more decisions were made on site from going to tender for several contracts to handling your own marketing. You do need to be much more in touch with what's happening in the mall and perhaps specialty leasing will once again become the place to grow small business like it was in the past. And what do you think are the big opportunities for mall operators these days? What are your predictions about what malls will look like, say, 20 years from now? Well, Richard, once we have a vaccine for COVID-19, shopping centers will once again become true community centers with auditoriums, cinemas, gyms, public markets. Those with high-density housing around them will be the most successful ones. And the small strip malls, in my opinion, will likely become distribution centers for online shopping. People will continue to love shopping. It's a great place to meet, to browse, to touch and feel what you want to buy. Shopping started many, many, many years ago when they traded fur at the markets in Quebec with Samuel Champlain and the most famous bay colors that we see today. Are you ready to find the best next hire to join your real estate business? Highview is committed to finding the best talent to fit your hiring needs. Our teams specialize in recruiting at all levels, from coordinators, analysts and operators, to managers, directors and vice presidents. Contact us today or visit us at highviewpartners.ca forward slash employers. So moving on to chapter three, 
Everyone that works in the industry in BC, and I'm sure right across the country, will be aware of what happened to you in July 2012. For our listeners who are unfamiliar with the Pegster, do you mind sharing your story? People who know me realize I'm an open book. Well, on July 12, 2012, in the middle of construction at Guildford Town Center, I took a bit of a break on a Saturday morning in White Rock and was riding my bike. And then I was hit by a tandem drum truck and catapulted into a ditch where a wonderful man jumped out of his car and held my head above the water. Believe it or not, the first thing I thought was, was that a truck coming out of Guilford Town Center? <laughs> this gentleman had saved my life. Until other people arrived, he called for help. I was airlifted to the Royal Columbian Hospital with 11 broken bones. During all the scans, they noticed what looked like a cloud in my brain. They didn't want a biopsy at the time as it was deep in my left parietal lobe. So they could continue to monitor by MRI until 2016 when they found a cyst that would then be biopsied and discovered to be a cancerous brain tumor. After only eight weeks of rehab, you were back at the office leading the charge during the redevelopment at Guildford. Can you remember what you were thinking at the time returning to work? I definitely went back to work way too soon. I loved my job and I wanted to be back at the mall at any cost. I had nurses coming to the office to clean my wounds and place new dressings. I got so tired that both the physiotherapist and the psychiatrist did an intervention to ensure I dropped back down to just a few days a week and worked my way back up to full time. Managing a mall just is not a part-time job. Peggy, you have a lot of close friends in the industry that you keep in touch with, but it's tough to stay in contact with everyone. I'd imagine there are a lot of people that you've worked with over the years that think about you often and probably wonder how you're getting on at the moment. So how are you doing, Peggy? I'm doing awesome. I just recently, within the last month or so, came off chemo. I had been on chemo for over four years. As well as the chemo, I was taking some pretty heavy-duty seizure medications. So I've decided on my own to go off all of this medication altogether. As a result, I feel absolutely fantastic, barring the occasional dizzy spell. When you're taking cytotoxic drugs, chemo, for over four years, your body has to be taking an incredible beating. My oncologist, Dr. Paul Klimo, will monitor after the next scan in December and we'll see what happens next. But I'm pretty sure this gal won't be taking any more chemo. <laughs> Good for you, Peggy. <laughs> so when, when we initially chatted about this podcast, you kindly sent me a copy of Shopping Center Chronicles. I feel like a real chat show host reading my guest's latest book ahead of my interview. Shopping Center Chronicles is a collection of short stories from your friends in the industry, reflecting back on some of the random, comical, moving, and interesting tales from life in a shopping center. There's so many great recollections, but one of my favorites, and perhaps this speaks to my immaturity, was by Sean Kelly called Junk on the Floor, about a patron at a coffee shop who was causing quite the stir as he sat down enjoying his coffee and donut, wearing shorts so short that his timbits were hanging out for all to see. There's an interesting tale by Brian Castle from Marathon Realty about a tense legal standoff with Safeway, who refused to sublease a location they'd exited in Vernon. Marilyn Bell writes about her reflections from 25 years in the business. And there are so many other really neat tales that capture the camaraderie between everyone that proudly calls themselves a shopping center professional. So what was the motivation behind this project? I can't tell you, Richard, how many times I walked through shopping centers with countless amounts of colleagues, and we would witness something really funny and say, you know, we should write a book about that. Well, with the help of Marilyn Bell and Petra Barker, we assembled as many stories as we could and put them together. We are hopeful to publish volume two, Uncensored. We already have five stories. We need to have at least 40 more to publish. That's a call to action for everybody to send in their stories, Peggy. So I'll put a link to the book in the show notes, but I understand all proceeds go to Dr. Paul Klimo. So can you tell us more about his work? 
Uh, well, Dr. Klimo is my oncologist, and he actually has a wing at the Lionsgate Hospital, the Dr. Paul Klimo chemotherapy wing. So um, all of the proceeds from this book are going to the Lionsgate Hospital Paul Klimo chemotherapy wing. I had a chuckle at the code name the security guys had for you, Papa Whiskey. What's the story behind this? <laughs> when security guards talk about you on the radio, they use uh, radio letters from each word. So Peggy would be Papa for the P. At the time, my last name was White, so W would be Whiskey. At the same time as I was Peggy White, I was working with Ted Williams and he was Tango Whiskey. So people must have thought we were super heavy drinkers. <laughs> <laughs> when, when we recently spoke on the phone, you were getting ready to go to Whistler for the weekend with friends. And on the activity list was a bungee jump. I think that tells us a lot about your zest for life. So what are your thoughts about the next chapter, Peggy? What are the goals do you have in store? I'm pretty much ready for anything. I get to spend lots of time with my beautiful granddaughter and my daughter, Kareem. I've been fostering kittens. In fact, I have a pregnant mama cat in my spare room right as we speak. I really enjoy mystery shopping. Uh, for some of our contractors, I've been checking cleanliness. I've been checking security officers in all the different shopping centers. Of course, once I can, I'll travel again as much as I possibly can while I possibly can. And finally, I really do hope to publish volume two of the Shopping Center Chronicles. So I can imagine the security teams will be on guard for you now that you've revealed you're a mystery shopper. <laughs> uh, well, Peggy, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your story and your advice. You're a real legend of the industry, and it's been really nice to chat with you. Good luck with the kittens, and I look forward to reading Chapter 2 of Shopping Center Chronicles. Thanks so much, Peggy. Thanks so much for having me, Richard. I had a great time. Thank you for listening to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers podcast brought to you by Highview Partners, a talent search and recruitment firm focused exclusively on Canadian real estate. If your real estate team is looking to find the best next hire, or if you're ready to make the best next move in your career, then reach out to Highview Partners today. Follow us on LinkedIn and visit us at highviewpartners.ca.